Welcome to Stillwater, Oklahoma, my hometown and home of the Oklahoma State University Cowboys. And I have a question for you. Who feeds Stillwater? Who feeds this population of 45,000 people? Well, it probably sounds like a silly question because we know there's no one person in charge of feeding Stillwater, nor is there even a committee in charge of feeding Stillwater. Instead, people go out and they have jobs and they earn money and they take that money, money earned mostly from non-farming occupations, and they use that money to buy food. And there's a lot of different places to buy food. There are five different grocery stores in town. There are a number of small specialty food stores. There are a lot of restaurants, including McDonald's, Texas Roadhouse, things like that. For a small town, we have a surprisingly large number of food trucks. And then there are sources of local foods like the Stillwater Farmers Market and an Oklahoma Food Cooperative. And so when you ask who feeds Stillwater, my answer is markets. Markets feed Stillwater. A variety of markets connect the citizens of Stillwater with food produced locally and around the world. And to help see this, I want to take you on a tour of my favorite grocery store in town, Consumers IGA. Here in my favorite grocery store, you can see the bounty that modern agriculture has provided. No society has ever had access to such plentiful, diverse, and inexpensive food as we do. And if you're willing to eat healthy, no society has ever found it easier to eat healthy. You can find bananas grown in Guatemala. Eggs from Indiana. Pork, likely produced from hogs that were raised in either Iowa or North Carolina. Peas, grown in New Jersey. Shrimp from Thailand. The bread might have been made from wheat that was grown just down the road. Well, if the bananas come from Guatemala, you might ask, did the store manager have to travel to Guatemala to get them? Did he have to negotiate with Guatemalan farmers to buy them. To answer that, I want to introduce you to Charles Fowler, the manager of the store. Charles, how do you get your bananas? Uh, we certainly don't make a trip to Guatemala, but uh, we have a contract set uh, yearly with our uh, produce warehouse associated wholesale grocery in Oklahoma City who provides us with bananas at a decent, sellable, profitable price. The store manager didn't have to email Indiana egg farmers to procure his eggs. Instead, he bought it from distributors. The store manager doesn't know whether the pork was produced from hogs raised in Iowa or North Carolina, nor does he need to know because he's going to get the pork from a distributor. He's not going to travel to different states to buy pork from hog farmers or slaughtering plants. To buy these peas, the store manager didn't have to negotiate deals with a lot of different pea farmers in New Jersey. Instead, he just bought it from a distributor, the Pick Sweet Company. The store manager didn't have to travel to Thailand to get the shrimp. Instead, he got it through a distributor from St. Louis. And so what markets do, it gives Thailand shrimp farmers access to consumers from around the world, and it gives citizens of Stillwater, Oklahoma, access to food grown around the world. We don't know where the wheat that was used to make this bread was grown. Even if it was grown right down the road, the store manager would have acquired this bread from the same place as if the wheat was grown in North Dakota. If the grocery store manager had to acquire all of the food sold in the store directly from the farmer, there would be much less variety and most of the products would be priced higher. The only way this store manager can bring you food from around the world is if markets bring it to him, just like the only way a Thailand shrimp farmer can sell the shrimp she catches to you is if she sells it in a market. 
we don't say farmers feed still water, we say markets feed still water. The reason is that for every dollar you spend on food, only about 16 cents goes back to the farmer to compensate them for their efforts. The rest goes to food processors, wholesalers, retailers. To give you an example, this is a pizza crust you can buy throw in the oven and make your own pizza crust with very little effort. Now certainly, the farmer made the wheat, that is one of the ingredients, but the food processor added even more value by turning that wheat into a pizza crust that you can make with very little effort and very nice packaging. And that activity by the food processor is valued more than the activities of the farmer. I want to repeat this because it is important. For every dollar you spend on food, only about 16 cents goes to the farmer to compensate them for their contribution and the contribution of those who produce farm inputs like fertilizer. The rest goes to food processors, wholesalers, retailers, and the like, suggesting that what happens to food after it leaves the farm is more important than what happens on the farm. Markets are the collection of the millions of exchanges occurring between the people who produce raw materials, the people who transform those materials into a consumer product, and the people responsible for bringing those goods to a convenient location to sell directly to consumers. Markets are simply a series of trades where food is property that changes hand from one person to another until it is finally eaten. The benefits of trade are obvious in a grocery store. Here in Oklahoma, we could produce our own bananas, but we'd have to do so in greenhouses, which would be very expensive. Instead, we import bananas from Guatemala. You see, Guatemala has a comparative advantage in banana production. That means they're more efficient at banana production. Their region is more suited to banana production. They can sell it at a lower price. Now, Guatemala, they could produce their own wheat but instead they import from us because Oklahoma has a comparative advantage in wheat. We're better at it. We can sell high quality wheat at a low price. And so essentially what Guatemala and, the, and Oklahoma are doing, we're trading wheat for bananas. Now we don't put together a commission from Oklahoma to travel to Guatemala to hammer out a trade deal where we trade so many bananas for so many bushels of wheat. Instead we rely on markets. Guatemalans buy wheat from Oklahoma because we sell high quality wheat at a cheap price. They buy it from markets. And we buy our bananas from markets and we happen to buy from Guatemala because they sell high quality bananas at a low price. And when we do this, when each region produces the good for which it has a comparative advantage in, we maximize the amount of food the whole world produces, thus feeding more people in the world. Even if all the regions of the world had the exact same soil, climate, and resources, making each region equally suited for the production of any good, they can still benefit by trading with one another. When a farm, or any business for that matter, is able to specialize in one or a few goods, they are able to hone their skills and purchase expensive machinery that boosts the productivity of labor. A small diversified farmer with 50 acres of wheat and 30 cows could never afford combines and expensive feeding equipment. Instead, some people specialize in wheat production and produce a lot of it with combines, and others manage large feedlots where they feed thousands of head of cattle. Trade encourages specialization because it gives any one business a larger potential base of customers. Kansas farmers would never raise as much wheat as it currently does if it could only sell wheat to other Kansans. It is because it can sell wheat around the world that it can produce enormous amounts of it with huge tractors and expensive, scientifically developed wheat seed. The U.S. produces far more wheat than they consume, and it is because of their large output that they can produce wheat at such a low price. We are able to do this because the wheat we do not consume is easily exported to other countries. So without trade, there is less specialization, less technological innovation and development, and less food. There is considerable specialization not only in what foods are produced, but one specific role in the production of that good. You even find specialization within the production of a single good. To produce this can of spinach, it required one firm that specialized in growing the spinach, one firm that specialized in producing the aluminum that makes up the can, and another firm that specializes in making the label to sell the can. 
It took a number of specialized firms to produce this chicken. There was a firm that specialized in raising the bird, a firm that specialized in producing the corn that was fed to the bird. There was a company that specializes in making the plastic wrap for the bird. And to ship the chicken from one place to another and preserve it, there was a company that specializes in making the refrigeration used on tractor trailers. In fact, trade is what allows citizens of the modern world to accumulate so much wealth. To illustrate, suppose that you are Robertson Crusoe, alone on an island, and everything you consume you have to produce yourself. Even if you know how to produce everything from grilled fish to pharmaceuticals, the fact that you have to spend so little of your time devoted to each good means that you will never become adept at producing any one good. There isn't enough time to polish your skills, research new production technologies, or build machinery and tools that improve your productivity. Though humans are the most intelligent of animals, we only prosper in groups. Alone on an island, we stand less chance of survival than a bird or even a dumb crab. Each of you will go out into the world and specialize in a particular job and will use the money you earn to buy goods produced by other people. Imagine how long it would take you to personally produce all the goods you consume in one day. One lifetime is not enough. We are prosperous because we specialize in trade. But this is no recent insight of my invention. It was best said by the French economist Bastiat in the 19th century. And we quote, It is impossible not to be struck with the measureless disproportion between the enjoyments which this man derives from society and what he could obtain by his own unassisted exertions. I venture to say that in a single day he consumes more than he could produce himself in 10 centuries. If you ask most people why food is so cheap today, they are likely to remark on the technological innovations in agriculture. And they would be correct, but they are likely to neglect to add that those innovations are made possible through markets. Most technologies tend to be useful only to larger farmers. The automated milking machines used on today's dairies greatly improves the productivity of labor, but is unprofitable on farms with just a few cows. Driverless tractors are a blessing for farmers with thousands of acres, but they are too expensive to use on a 50-acre farm. As we have seen, large farms and thus better technologies are only desirable if regions can trade with one another. Technology does not fall from the sky like manna from heaven. Most of the time they are the deliberate attempt of an entrepreneur to make money. That's why governments award entrepreneurs who create new technologies with patents give them a monopoly on the sale of that technology for a number of years. Indeed, the first U.S. patent was awarded to Samuel Hopkins in 1790 for his new way of acquiring potash from the ashes of burnt plants. There's no doubt that trade and technology has reduced the price of food over time. But some people wonder if the low price of food they see in the grocery store also has some hidden costs that society pays for but isn't reflected in that grocery store price. Examples might be soil erosion, which hinders the ability of future generations to feed themselves, or water pollution caused from overuse of chemical fertilizers and livestock manure. And those people, they might believe those hidden costs are so large that if they were included in the grocery store price, they think that food today might actually be more expensive than it was, say, five decades ago. And those individuals may seek a different place to buy food. Maybe they'll turn from conventional food to organic food, but some of them don't even like organic food if it's sold by a corporation like Walmart. And so they, so they seek something vastly different than the grocery store, and they might go to a farmer's market. And so the question of who feeds Stillwater is answered every day by where we decide to shop. And to understand modern agriculture, we have to not only understand the modern grocery store, but the modern farmer's market.